Hey everybody, it's Caleb. Welcome back to episode two in your blockchain series. If you're just jumping in, then I encourage you to watch this from the playlist from the beginning, because that's gonna give you all the information you need to, to learn the foundation of blockchain and all the different cryptocurrency types out there. So what are we gonna talk about in this video? We're gonna be talking about the actual blockchain data structure. Well, first let's just do a quick recap of the previous video, which is why blockchain so freaking cool. And basically it's decentralized, it's distributed, it's public, it's permissionless, and it's permanent. Uh, that might not be the exact order I gave them in the previous video, but those are the five attributes I kind of put together. They're not like the official blockchain attributes or anything. But if you can remember those things, then you're pretty much gonna understand the basis of blockchain. Now do keep in mind, blockchain is an industry. There is not the blockchain. Instead, we have a bunch of different blockchains out there. We have the Bitcoin blockchain, Ethereum blockchain, and so forth. So this is the basis. Some of these might have slight variations in how they work. So just keep that in mind. We're kind of learning the, the foundation. This is describing how the Bitcoin blockchain works. And then all the other ones are just variations of that. So once you understand why Bitcoin is a thing, what problems it's trying to solve, peer-to-peer -peer payments online, you can start to think about what the data structure actually looks like. And it's literally a chain of blocks. Each one of these blocks, you can think of them as commits, you know, like here are the transactions we're adding to the blockchain. Boom, these ones. We wait a little bit, around 10 minutes in Bitcoin's case. Boom, we're adding these ones. And then these ones and then these ones. And you know, that is just the perfect time to interrupt our learning, to thank our sponsor, which I almost forgot to say, and I just dropped my chalk and it exploded everywhere. So in order for me to buy new chalk, we need your support. So sign up for a Ruby debit card from crypto.com and you'll get a $25 bonus. So here's my debit card. It's not Ruby, but one day you'll get, you'll get here, don't worry. Basically, the way this works is I stake crypto.com coin and that grows at 10%. So not only am I getting interest from that, but I'm also getting 3% back with my debit card. So any purchase I make, boom, 3%. There's also some special offers where you get 100% back. Right now you get 100% back on Netflix, 100% back on Spotify, and that's money that you could just have for free. Like why wouldn't you do this? This thing is so powerful. I mean, honestly, if Thanos had the option of choosing the Infinity Stones or a Crypto.com debit card, I think he'd go with this. That's how much cash back you get with these things, up to 8%. It's a fantastic place to buy, sell cryptocurrencies and get a little bit of extra bonus. So I'm loving this card. I'm probably gonna use it for like literally everything. <laughs> so stay tuned and we'll, we'll give you some more information on Crypto.com throughout this series. But yeah, I almost forgot the most important part. If you want to support this channel, then use the referral code Caleb. That's me, I'm Caleb. So for you computer science nerds out there, this structure is essentially a linked list where each node is a block. Now the way they're connected is a little bit different. Instead of this block pointing to the next block, it kind of works the other way around where this block is going to have the hashed version of the previous block in this block's information. So these are cryptographically connected such that if we changed something in this block, it's going to change the hash for each one of these, basically changing the entire blockchain. So because of a, an important system that makes this blockchain possible called proof of work, which we're gonna get into that, it would be very, very difficult to change a piece of information in like a block really far back. The farther back the block, the harder it is to change that information, which is why people say blockchain is permanent. So each one of these blocks contains transactions. So it might be something like 0.5 Bitcoin two. And what, what, what's this two here? What do we put here? Well, I mentioned in the previous video that it doesn't have the person's name. It doesn't just give out everybody's identity. We have pseudonyms. And this is actually going to be an address. It's just a combination of characters. So we'll just put address. Now, what does an address actually look like? 
Well, it varies. There's a couple different forms, but it's just a giant sequence of characters, maybe like 34 characters long. So here's an example Bitcoin address. It can also be represented with a QR code. So if someone's working with a wallet, they can scan your QR code. Like I mentioned, there's a bunch of different formats for the address. The most recent is BEC32, if you wanna research that. And also be aware that every blockchain is going to be different. So if you send Bitcoin to a Bitcoin cash address, that's a good way to lose your money. Now, here's the question. This address, how does the blockchain know that this is you? How do you have permission to then spend that money? Well, this address is actually derived from something called your private key. So it's gonna look something like this. Private key, and this can generate, there's actually another step in here, the public key. And then this public key can generate your address. And this is a one way conversion. So if you have this private key, you can generate this address. But if you have this address, you can't work your way back and generate the private key. So the address does not give away your private key. You can share the address with other people. However, your private key, this is basically your username, email, and password for the Bitcoin. It's 100% access to the funds to spend them. This is basically proof that you are able to spend these monies. <laughs> Such a weird way to say it, these monies. So, you know, if I have a private key and you send money to this address, I'll be able to spend that money because I have that private key. So don't give that out to anybody, no exceptions. Now, what does a private key look like? Well, here, let me show you mine. <laughs> Psych, I ain't dumb. But basically, a private key is going to be 64 characters long, hexadecimal, so digits 0 through 9 and A through F. And if you want more information on the binary junk, I have some videos on binary, hexadecimal, all that stuff. And I also have videos a little bit on cryptography and hashing, which you can watch those as well. But basically, with hex, one hexadecimal number or, or character coordinates with four bits. So a 64 length hex number is going to coordinate to a 256 bit number. So when people say the private key is 256 bits, you can represent that using just 64 characters, anything zero through nine or A through F. Now in general, and I'm not gonna get into this in too much detail, an address is a one-time use thing. So what that means is if you want to continue to receive money from people, you're going to need a lot of addresses. And because these addresses come from a private key, you're going to need a lot of private keys. So how do you manage so many of these private keys? Well, a lot of times you're going to have a seed phrase in whatever wallet application you use. So there's tons of wallet applications and I really don't wanna to get too much into the applied cryptocurrency part of this. This is really just supposed to be the theory behind this. I do have videos on how to do this if you want to go check those out, how to get started buying Bitcoin or whatever it might be. But basically, you're going to have a wallet application that has a seed phrase. And this is gonna be a sequence of words, you know, maybe 12 words, maybe 24 words. And this seed phrase can be used to generate all of the private keys that you're going to need. So it's gonna look like this. This is just a really simple example, but we can generate numerous private keys from this seed phrase. And then that allows us to have a new address for every single transaction. So it might look like this. Don't worry too much about the public key. You actually don't really see that a whole lot when working with cryptocurrencies but we have the private keys that we manage. And actually this is a managed service with the seed phrase. So all we have to remember is the seed phrase. The private keys are generated, the addresses are generated, and then you can send these out to different people. So, you know, I send an invoice to John, I send an invoice to Sally, and I send an invoice to Kara. So that's how it can look. So now we just have a master password. This is going to give us full access to all of our funds for that wallet. All right, I've got some other stuff in here. The immutability of blockchain, Genesis blocks, confirmations. There's a lot of stuff. Basically, what happens is 
As the chain continues to grow, it becomes more and more difficult to change information earlier on in the chain. And each time a new block is added, the transaction is said to have a new confirmation. So in that first block, it'll have one confirmation. You know, like you send me money, it gets added to the blockchain as one confirmation. Then a new block is added, which has the hash of the previous block integrated in this block. We'll talk a little bit about how that works later on. Now we have two confirmations because that transaction is two levels deep in this blockchain. And I'm just gonna draw some more history here just so you can kind of see where it's at. So this is the one we're interested in. And then we add a new block and now we have three confirmations. Generally at this point, it's considered permanent. For lightweight transactions, you know, buying a coffee or whatever, one confirmation is typically fine. It's the equivalent of like if you sell something and someone pays with a debit card and then they go and tell the debit card company that it was fraud or try to cancel that transaction. There's a chance it can be reversed. But it happens so rarely that merchants don't really worry too much about it. They just sell things like normal. They don't sell and then say, hey, after 30 days and it's settled, then I'll send you the product. No, they just send the product and most people don't do that. Same thing with blockchain. With something having one confirmation, yeah, there's possibilities that it can be changed or that this person can maliciously manipulate the blockchain, but it's very unlikely. So for small purchases, that's usually fine. For larger purchases, the merchant might want three confirmations. At three confirmations, that transaction is already three levels deep. And for that buyer to modify this block and this block and this block while competing with the entire network of this cryptocurrency, that's actually very difficult. So three is like that magic number. And then if you want like super, super confirmed, six. At that point, it's like, it's in the blockchain, you know? It's a, it's a thing, they're like, they're mended together. That transaction is not leaving that blockchain unless there's a really big problem with the blockchain. But anyways, one for small transactions, three for pretty big transactions, and then six is just like eternally permanent. And you can see this history goes back. At some point it had to start. And this is known as the Genesis block. So yeah, I don't really have anything to say about that besides the fact that it was the first block. So we talk about these blocks and how transactions are added into them, but I haven't really gotten very specific on the actual blockchain protocol. This is one of those things that varies from blockchain to blockchain. In the case of Bitcoin, a new block is added on average every 10 minutes. So when you buy that coffee, it could take 10, 15, 20 minutes maybe for that block to be confirmed. But again, the chances of it not working are low. You can probably just buy that coffee and leave. If the seller wants to make sure they get their money, they might need to wait until that block is confirmed, which could take 10 or 20 minutes. The time varies because it takes a randomized time based on how long it takes to mine these blocks. And we're gonna get into Bitcoin mining here in the series as well but on average, it's every 10 minutes. So if they want three confirmations, you might buy that car and then have to sit there waiting for like 30 minutes before those three blocks are confirmed. So all these things that describe how the blockchain works is described as the protocol. And these are very hard to change. And this is what allows people to build trust in that specific blockchain because they know it's going to follow a certain set of rules. They can be changed. However, it's a very gradual process and Bitcoin is one of the slowest ones to change where every change is a big deal. Some of the other blockchains that are developing much more quick or doing different things, they might have very big changes very often. So a lot of people think of Bitcoin as like the, uh, the trustworthy 
gold standard, I guess. And if there are major changes, this can actually cause a division, a fork of that blockchain that could potentially survive in parallel. So that is known as a hard fork. And a lot of the different blockchains out there are actually just Bitcoin forks. So let's say there's a big disagreement and you know we want to change that block time. Well, that's gonna be something that's pretty hard to, to do in the Bitcoin network. So, oh, we'll just do it our we'll just do it on our own. We'll create a new cryptocurrency. We'll take your guys' code because it's open source and then that's fine. But we're gonna change that block time down to two and a half minutes. That would be a really severe case where you know that new cryptocurrency exists in parallel with Bitcoin and you can choose which one you want. But in some cases, those changes can be brought into the original project such that the original blockchain, let's say Bitcoin, actually adapts over time. So that is all I have for this video. There are some extra resources in the blog if you want to do a little bit extra reading. Stay tuned for the next video. We're gonna continue our discussion on blockchain, get into some more specifics. Again, thank you for watching. If you wanna support this channel, just ask that you go try crypto.com out. Great place to buy and sell cryptocurrencies if you're just looking to get started learning the different projects. I recommend crypto.com. You can use the referral link, Caleb, and it's just an app that you can download on your phone. Really simple. Other than that, congrats for making it this far. You're already doing better than probably like three fourths of the people that started this series. So continue watching and we're gonna continue learning a ton. If you enjoy the content, please be sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.